keynote talk at, at the workshop. Um, Peter is a professor of international relations at the University of Sussex. Um, he has also a long history at the University of East Anglia, University of Oxford and, and other uh, institutions. He has focused on a lot of issues related to environment and development. And, and that's why both Jacob and I thought that Peter would be the perfect person to kick off this workshop. Um, he's focusing a lot on energy and climate change, on environmental justice, on a political economy of energy transitions, um, non-state actors you've written a book about. So there's a lot of different aspects that, that come together, which we think makes per Peter the perfect person to, to kick off this workshop. Um, so, Peter, I will hand it over to you to talk about the political economy of incumbency beyond fossil fuel capitalism. Floor Great, yours. thank you very much. Um, so thanks both to, to Harrow and Jakob for inviting me here and to, to Lund and SEI for uh, organising this event. And actually, it's a real pleasure to, to be at SEI. I've never, never actually been here. I've been to Stockholm once many, many years ago, uh, but never made it to SEI, uh, despite the fact at one point in my career, I worked for Climate Network Europe in, in Brussels, working on climate change issues. And that outfit was funded by SEI, but uh, never successfully made it here. So great to be here. Um, so what I want to talk about today, since I'm not, unlike most of you in the room, I suspect, um, a specialist on fossil fuel subsidies, but as, as Harrow has just said, I've walked, worked more broadly on issues of energy transitions, low carbon energy transitions in particular, and the politics and political economy of climate change. So what I want to do really in this opening 25 minutes or so is just sort of situate this debate that we're going to be having, this discussion over the next couple of days in a broader uh, political context. Um, give and, and relate it to these broader issues and debates around the political economy of energy transitions. Um, given that I've been doing some work in the last few years around those transitions in places like Kenya, India, South Africa and Argentina, but also I'm part of um, what's called the STEP Centre, which is um, an ESRC funded research centre based at the University of Sussex. Um, and STEP stands for Social, Technological and Environmental Pathways to Sustainability. And in that centre, we've been doing some work over the last couple of years on the politics of green transformations. And so, again, that relates quite nicely uh, to some of the things that we're going to be um, talking about today. So for me, the, the debate about fossil fuel subsidy reform um, is one site of this broader struggle, if you like, involving a whole range of different forces, actors, institutions, militating for and against different um, energy pathways. Um, and so to explain these two slightly random pictures, <laughs> there's a danger for me in this discussion that we, we try to sort of prune some of the, uh, the branches, if you like, of the, of the tree. But beneath it, we need to somehow address root and branch, and the, they are very long roots spreading very far and wide, uh, the broader nature of power that underpins the fossil fuel economy. And so I was thinking, well, which is the most appropriate image? And we can discuss later on which is, which is more appropriate. The other one might be of an octopus with numerous tentacles uh, spreading far and wide and with enormous suction power um, holding, holding the global economy to, to get together. Um, so really, in my talk um, will be divided in two parts. First of all, I want to think about the nature of incumbency. So I'm guessing here a lot of you are familiar with literatures on transitions and this notion of incumbency. People talk about the incumbent power, the existing regime and order, if you like, largely at the moment still organised around uh, fossil fuels. But then latterly talk about where are the moments of change? And clearly the, the momentum around fossil fuel subsidies is one such uh, moment where that momentum is occurring. Um, so firstly, though, thinking about incumbent power, I guess the obvious starting point is to note that there is an incumbent regime, that despite everything we know about climate change, about the urgency of, act, of, of action, we knew this well before Paris, but Paris has high, um, you know, put emphasis on it again. The need to try and keep warming below 1.5 to 2 degrees requires drastic transformative action uh, across a whole range of sectors. And yet governments, as some of these images convey, continue to invest heavily in fossil fuels of one sort or another, whether it's uh, coal, oil or gas. And indeed are going for more and more extreme forms of extraction, whether it's uh, tar sands, fracking uh, or whatever. So the system is still moving very much uh, in, the wrong, in the wrong direction with the age of fossil fuels, despite what some people are saying, is very far from, from being over. And not only is it standing still, but it's expanding. So you can see this graphic around um, increased numbers of uh, coal-fired power stations. Um, you can see South Africa, India, China, but also uh, nearer to home in other parts of Europe. 
So it's not that this incumbent regime is standing still or in retreat in lots of ways, it's actively expanding if we think about this in broader uh, global terms. And of course, it's reflected in the sorts of things we're talking about today. Now, you all know better than I that these figures are, are contested. It depends on how you define them. Um, but the figures are enormous, the amount of money that goes into fossil fuel subsidies. There's the 5.3 trillion that the IMF talks about. You can break this down per day, per hour, per minute. Uh, but I guess the key point over here, and this is where, which reflects the power relations that I'm talking about, is the amount that goes towards fossil fuel um, energy as opposed to renewable energy in terms of subsidies, which I think the new climate economy report that some of you here were responsible for uh, said 69% goes towards fossil fuels and just 9% towards renewable energy at, at the moment. So the obvious question is, from a political point of view, why is all this still happening in spite of everything we know about, about climate change? Uh, and also in spite of the, the, right, the falling costs of, of renewable energy, particularly solar perhaps, why are we still locked into this state of affairs? And here's just a few um, perhaps slightly obvious but nevertheless important answers to that question. And one is about the relationship between states and the fossil fuel economy. Um, as we know, governments own around 50% of the world's production of fossil fuels. 70% um, of oil and gas production um, is through companies that are wholly or partly state-owned. So states themselves, the, the very actors that we're wanting to act on climate change, are heavily locked into uh, the ownership and use and consumption of, of fossil fuels. So in many ways, the subsidies we're talking about today are a form of state aid to the private sector, precisely because governments still take the view that they're crucial to the achievement of their own objectives around energy security, around energy access. And there's a, another sort of murkier, if you like, political economy behind that, which is around clientelism and the use of those subsidies to build political constituencies with support that keep governments in power. In, and, you know, much of the work that people in this room have done shows that uh, fairly clearly. And it's been harder thus far, at least, for renewable energies or lower carbon uh, energy actors to make that case that they can deliver on those key core state objectives in quite the same way. Linked to that, of course, is a long... Uh, literature and experience of, of what's often referred to as, as the resource curse, the shared interests in elites and uh, fossil fuel companies, particularly the focus has been on oil, obviously, um, in protecting themselves from popular pressures for meaningful change by living off the rents from extracting resources. Um, now, you know, in, in some parts of the world, people talk about this as neo-extractivism. In Latin America, it's talked about as a progressive thing. How can you use the rents from resources for progressive social purposes? It's not always a negative thing. But the effect politically is often to insulate elites from, from popular pressures for reform. And that makes the ongoing exploitation of those resources uh, very attractive uh, for state elites. Related to that, then, is this point about can we imagine, as we try to decarbonize energy systems in particular, that those elites will give up some of that control? It's harder, perhaps, for them to secure a rent from decentralized renewable energy systems of one sort or another. I expect we'll hear this in a lot of the case studies that we're going to be discussing over the next couple of days. But a lot of the, the battle around energy policy is, you know, who gets to make that policy? Who is it that gets to capture the rent? So thinking of some work we've been involved with in Kenya, a lot of that discussion there is around um, can the counties, given that there's been changes in the constitution and a, and a degree of devolution, can they start to have more of a voice in energy policy? But national level elites are, un, are reluctant to, to let go of that control. It's easier for them to, to take a cut of contracts coming through uh, around larger, larger scale energy projects. And so there is this sort of bias towards larger, larger energy systems, which perhaps militates against some types of uh, renewable energy, at least. And so potentially you get these conflicts of interest. We're saying states are the key actors. We need green entrepreneurial states to invest in research and development, to take, take on some of the risks of innovation. We need them to be the key actors on climate change. And yet still very much they're locked in to um, the fossil fuel economy uh, in many ways. So it's not just about the executive part of, the, of, of government, if you like. It's also this extended state that I'm talking about here. Um, traditionally, uh, people might have talked about it in terms of a military industrial complex, but it, it you know, seeps into universities that are heavily reliant on, on money from, from fossil fuels as well. So we're talking about a broader complex of, of state power that's quite closely intertwined uh, with the fossil fuel economy. Here's just one uh, representation of it from 
uh, the world development movement, a group in the UK now called Global Justice Now. This is focused on the UK, but you could do a similar type of analysis in many other settings. It's what they call the fossil fuel web of power and the intricate, often personal links, the social networks which link financing of, uh, to fossil fuel industries to government and the ways in which these things intertwine and intermesh uh, quite, quite intimately. So these dimensions of power I'm talking about overlap and reinforce one another uh, in, in different ways. So beyond the national level, of course, there's also the international uh, side of all of this, not only in terms of how different societies and the sorts of uh, politics that we're going to be talking about at case study level over the next day or so play out, but also their, their knock-on consequences. And this is what I mean by the boomerang effects, that the energy policy choices made in some parts of the world have massive implications elsewhere. So Harrow mentioned you know, some earlier work on, on precisely these sorts of issues, energy justice questions. Who is it that pays for ongoing um, energy choices that, that countries make that lock them into extractivist paradigms? Someone somewhere uh, will find their land uh, being, being used to, to access coal or oil. Communities will be being displaced, etc. There's ongoing social and environmental spillover effects, obviously, of these sorts of choices. And how do we hold countries to, to account for that? Um, and that, of course, then plays into the global governance of, of fossil fuels, if you like. And I've deliberately put up the ungovernance, because there's vast areas of the global architecture of institutions that we have that are not addressing these questions head on. Um, so many of you represent organisations that are taking on this agenda and are pushing for progressive change. Um, but, um, you know, there's many parts of the, of the UN system and of international organisations more generally um, that are reluctant to get too involved in dealing with some of the policies and mechanisms uh, which sustain support uh, for fossil fuels. And then, of course, there's the material side. It's not just about the politics that we're talking about today, either at national level or, or international level. It's also about production, finance and culture, the sort of material basis of fossil fuel civilization, if you like. It's partly about the tight um, networks that link together production, the financial flows, either on the private side or export credit agencies, etc. Um, and the challenges that then poses in terms of interstate action, trying to break the individual chains which sustain uh, this, this system. Um, it's partly about how can you redirect the massive amounts of finance, as I've already showed, that go into the fossil fuel uh, economy. That's a bigger project. You, you're probably aware that UNEP has been looking at this over the last few years and uh, recently published a report thinking about that very question. How do you realign the global financial system with the imperatives of sustainability? What might that look like? So, you know, in their report, it's how much progress is being made, but what tools, triggers, levers, mechanisms might you use to try and steer it in a more uh, sustainable direction? Um, I'll come back to that when I talk about um, sites of, of change uh, going forward. But it's also an often neglected aspect of this, perhaps particularly um, where I sit in, you know, in politics, international relations, is the cultural aspect, that the fossil fuel economy, and there's been numerous controversies around this in the UK, where I come from, about the sponsorship of, of the arts, Art Not Oil, BP sponsorship of um, um, many art exhibitions in the UK. And that's where this picture comes from, the, from the Art Not Oil campaigns. Um, so there's a, both in terms of media sponsorship, sponsorship of arts, um, access to public domains, there's a broader struggle to, do, to be had around um, the legitimation of particular energy sources um, in, in the global economy. And what that does is sort of normalise particular infrastructures, <coughs> Uh, energy systems and ways of doing things and it's something that also I think has to be addressed in this broader uh, move towards towards decarbonisation. Again taking this, putting this in a slightly broader historical um, context, many people writing in sort of international political economy will, will talk about the, the, the neat fit between the nature of fossil fuels, the properties of them, their materiality, if you like, and the way that the global economy is currently organised. And that's a massive challenge if we're seriously thinking about moving away from that and trying to uh, see a bigger role for renewable energy. The fact that we have a more globalised export-led um, economy uh, means that we are dependent on sort of cheap energy for transporting goods over large distances. There's an element of infrastructural lock-in organised around central, central grids. Again, that biases particular types of energy. 
the preferences for large projects and in, in investments over decentralized um, solutions. Going back to what I was saying before about the multiple possibility of extracting uh, rents. So if you think of the work of Timothy Mitchell, some of you may be aware of his work, looking at that relationship between fossil fuels and democracy uh, more broadly. So these are some of the, the, bigger, the bigger challenges and things that we, we need to think about. Because thus far, I mean, this goes back to arguments that Matt Patterson and I are making some years ago in a book called Climate Capitalism. Thus far, at least, it's been easier for fossil fuel actors and interests to argue that their sectors have a privileged role, that they, they're the only ones that can really deliver core state priorities around growth and security, et cetera, that in more critical political economy terms, they represent the interests of capital in general, that they serve all other sectors more effectively, and therefore they, have a, they are a special interest that sits above other interests. This is what I mean by the, the you have different fractions of capital competing to say, that they deserve state support, that they're crucial to growth strategies, uh, but it's easier, it has been thus far, um, for fossil fuel interests to argue that theirs are the interests of capital in general. And that's a key argument that we have to win. Somehow, somehow you have to show there's a bigger coalition of winners from a low carbon economy that can compete with, with those sorts of claims. And so it explains why, this is going back even further now, and I'll start to come back to the present and the, and the sites of change, but just sort of to wrap up on this part, you can see the, the intertwined histories of, of capitalism and, and fossil fuels, that fossil fuels and shifts in their use from one source to another have been absolutely central to industrial revolution, Fordism, globalization, all these big reorganizations of the economy. And I'm talking about that because that's precisely what we're talking about being required right now a rewiring, a reorganization. People talk about it as a new industrial revolution that's required to try and tackle climate change and to decarbonize the economy. And the challenge, it strikes me, is that when we've had those things, and I'm thinking of the work of people like Carlotta Perez, I don't know if people know her work on financial capital, technological revolutions, how it's this restlessness on the part of finance capital that they're not getting enough of a return from the existing order and that they push for a new way of doing things, a reorganization of technologies and systems. That's when you get this big change. But it always comes about when um, there's a new something that's even more profitable, more convenient, there's more cost effectiveness, more efficiencies, greater profitability. And it's still harder at the moment for you know, renewable energies and non-fossil fuel energies to compete on those terms. Um, and so this is, for me, this is the strategic question. How can you convince enough powerful actors within the current system that they have more to gain from a lower carbon economy than from the existing way of doing things? Very, very briefly, because you're the experts on this, not me, on the case of fossil fuels, what does, this, what does the experience so far of fossil fuel subsidy reform suggest in the light of everything I've said? One of the things, I think, is given the nature of the reliance of many states on, on the fossil fuel economy um, is to think about the sensitivity of the social base of state power. So, you know, the, as you know, examples of flashpoints in Nigeria and Bolivia and many other countries when there's been an attempt to try and deal with uh, uh, support to, to fossil fuels. There's a lot of popular resistance to that. I'll come back later on to talk about that in terms of the just transition. I know there's one or two people here from South Africa where that phrase is used quite a lot to talk about the just transition, dealing with the losers of shifts away from a fossil fuel economy. But it strikes me as absolutely vital to deal with that. What I think it also suggests, though, is that it's going to be hard for us to think about one-size-fits-all solutions to dealing with fossil fuel subsidies. You have to go with the grain of political economies and how they're organised in different parts of the world. Um, and this isn't just about the global south. Um, examples here from the UK attempts to deal with fuel tax. This was in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s. Because the, the, po the politics of tax in places like the UK and, of course, the US is so toxic that it's very, very difficult to, to make a, a good case for um, reducing um, those forms of support on, on environmental grounds. Now, let me move into the second part of my talk um, quite quickly. So that's perhaps the more pessimistic <laughs> story about the levels of lock-in, the scale of complexity that we're trying to deal with here. But let me try and now point out a few areas where I think there might be uh, evidence of change in this broader terrain that I'm describing that frames some of our discussions over the next day or so. You can argue, it has been argued, 
People argued this in the wake of the Paris Agreement. They were arguing it before, that we are reaching some sort of political tipping point, um, that this is a key moment, a key conjuncture, if you like, in the demise of this global fossil fuel regime. They argue that on the ground of falling oil prices or peak oil, if, if you go for that hypothesis, um, evidence that even countries that have been heavily locked into fossil fuels thus, thus far are starting to diversify their energy mixes. The big wave of pressure around divestment, uh, fossil fuel divestment from you know, pension funds and universities, etc. The wave of shareholder activism that's been targeted at some of the biggest players in this sector, think of BP, Exxon, etc. The falling costs of, of renewable energy, perhaps particularly solar, the pressure from the climate regime. You saw some of the reactions to the Paris Agreement with people in the coal industry saying that they you know, um, felt that they, they no longer had a social license to operate, that it was the, it was the end game for their industries, etc. Hugely exaggerated, I think, in light of what I've said so far. Uh, but nevertheless, this is, this is some of the discourse. The shifting perceptions on the part of investors that I'll come back to at the moment, the subsidies reforms that we're talking about today, but also the social movements, the climate justice movement, those movements seeking to keep fossil fuels in the ground. So the configuration of those things might be creating... Uh, the political opportunity to, to really advance this in a, in a more progressive direction. And alongside that, there are signs of hope, um, the ways in which industrial policy is back on the agenda. Um, my colleague Mariana Matsukatu talks about it in terms of the green entrepreneurial state, um, that you know, much as everyone's talking about the private sector, this still will be largely state-led in lots of ways in terms of initial investments in R&D, using tax breaks, subsidies, whatever it might be, taking on uh, risks, targeting technologies that will benefit poorer people in particular, things that are not of interest to the private sector, uh, but using a whole suite of different state policies um, to try and move uh, the, the economy in a, in a lower carbon direction. And that's true also at the global level, going back to the work that UNEP and others are doing that I referred to before about rewiring the economy uh, along lower carbon lines. And that might mean using sometimes unpopular policy tools. World Trade Organization certainly doesn't like them sometimes. Local content requirements, infant industry protection, uh, the use of tax and subsidies um, to try and support those sectors and industries that will steer us in a lower carbon uh, direction. But going back to what I was saying before, I think it's also about how can you engage very powerful fractions of capital or business interests in this project of decarbonisation so that you do set unsettle um, the incumbent regime. Um, and I think that's where some of the key momentum lies. You know, in international relations, people often talk about this historical moment as a, a finance-led regime of accumulation, if you like, that finan financial actors are dominant, that they've managed to persuade governments that, um, that their um, interests are vital to their growth strategies. So can you use the power of those financial actors to try and bring about shifts to a lower, to a lower carbon economy? And again, thinking about the looking back at historical examples, how and when and why has that been possible and can we learn from that in the current moment where we're thinking about divestment, pressure to disclose, um, um, exposure to, to climate change, et cetera, that, that companies have in terms of their assets. And obviously the stranded assets argument is one clear manifestation of, of this where we're talking about as much as 80% of coal, oil and gas reserves now being unburnable or stranded. This is an obvious manifestation of where this logic, uh, logic can take us. And I'm, you know, I remain hopeful that that's one important way of, of dealing with this. But what I would say as well as, and I'm going to wrap up with, with this in a way, um, as well as engaging in that elite politics, trying to persuade governments to do things differently, trying to shape investor perceptions um, of where their money should be placed. And in a way as we put it in the book on climate capitalism, trying to right, reposition investments in fossil fuels as a liability and not an asset. That strikes me ultimately as the key aim. If you can persuade investors that the more they invest in fossil fuels, the more they're locking themselves into something which might be more regulated in the future, that will be subject to more tax, that will not have a social license to operate, the, and the more you can make attractive uh, investments in renewable energies, the, the, the greater the chances are we'll, we'll bring about the sort of shift uh, I'm talking about. So you have to go for that elite politics game. But what I think we also have to do, and this I think comes through very strongly um, in the work on, on fossil fuel subsidies, is engage in an honest and open debate about winners and losers. And this is what I mean by the just transitions. There's a great book on this by um, some colleagues in South Africa looking at precisely these issues. 
But it strikes me these issues are pertinent to all of the countries that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of the days. What's the explicit social compact of transition, if you like? There will be winners and losers. Some sectors will be in decline. Some people will lose their jobs. So what's going to be the retraining, the compensation, the safety nets, the cash transfers? What are the mechanisms by which you can manage that tradition, uh, transition in a more socially uh, just and equitable way? And of course, there's examples of this around the world, from Poland and Germany, when you talk about winding down support for, the, for coal industries, retraining, creating new job opportunities for people. Also imposing social obligations. Um, so if you think about in South Africa, right, the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers Procurement Program, where you have black economic empowerment criteria, um, where there's an emphasis on trying to make sure that you capture some of the benefits of uh, investments in renewable energy. That there's, there's jobs, that the technology stays there, that the benefits are getting. So it's not just creating a new bubble of investment in, a, in renewable energy, but actually you're actually capturing some of the um, some of the benefits. So in conclusion, because I think I'm out of time, Harrow's slowly getting out of his chair, which suggests to me that time <laughs> is up. Uh, either that or he's going for another coffee. Um, so in conclusion, uh, clearly fossil fuel subsidy reform is a critical and important site. I think it's fantastic that we're having this debate and that things are moving positively in the right direction. I do think we need to situate it as part of this broader challenge that I'm talking about. Think about it as one, albeit very important tool that we can focus on. Um, I do think we need to think about these broader social justice dimensions uh, and some of the work I've read from people in this room said, you know, shows that in reality you won't get anywhere unless you deal with those sorts of things uh, more clearly. And I think if we do frame this as a broader challenge of decarbonisation, it's not just about the politics and the institutions we're talking about here. It is also about dealing with some of these other material, socio and cultural aspects. It is about getting to the, the roots of the tree <laughs> that I started with, um, rather than just thinking about trimming, trimming the branches, if you like. Um, and there are signs of progress, I think, uh, and, but clearly there's many challenges ahead. But if history tells us anything, it's that such changes or deeper transformations uh, can take decades and sometimes centuries. Um, but as this thing from Greenpeace suggests, it always seems impossible until it's done and we're not done yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks indeed, uh, Peter. Let me just put on the of the slides. And thanks for, for sketching um, the, the challenges ahead of us, which, which are not just limited to fossil fuel subsidies, but as you say, they're, they're related to carbon lock-in and, and what, what uh, Anja Gouria has referred to as, as carbon entanglement, which is a much broader challenge. Um, also, thanks for pointing out, and I think this is something that will probably uh, come back uh, throughout the two days in the different case studies, at the different political economies of, of, of fossil fuel subsidies, which might play out differently in, in different countries. But also thanks for pointing out some of the opportunities and, and some of the, the, the shifts that we're witnessing and some of the discussions about divestment and fossil fuel subsidy reform, as, as also Thijs will talk about later. Um, the stranded assets discussion, which we'll maybe not discuss in too much detail at this workshop, but for example in the conference in September, we'll definitely uh, go into that in more detail. And then finally, also thanks for pointing out some of the the, 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 the lessons that we can possibly learn from, from existing transitions, not just in the energy realm, but also in other issue areas. And I'm sure that, that some of the, the, the papers will speak to that as well. Um, we have about 10, 15 minutes for a number of questions. My suggestion is to take a few questions in a row, and then Peter can answer the ones that he likes to answer. Um, so I'm sure some of you will have some questions. We have Laura, anyone else? Ron? Okay, let's start with the two of you. That's a great presentation. It gave us a really good overview of um, where we sit at the moment in this debate. But we've also just been through this whole financial crisis. Yeah. Um, we've just sort of come through a whole financial crisis where the, where the banks were considered really too big to fail. Mm. And there the governments um, came in and they put loads of money behind them. So, But we hadn't seen that, for example, when say in Finland Nokia's failed or technologies go under. So I just wondered um, what kind of comparisons or links or lessons or things we should watch out for basically from how that sort of how's the state interacted with those big financial institutions and what we can learn in terms of their relationship and moving forward on with the fossil fuel sector. 
Yeah, Ron Steenblick from um, the OECD. Um, I, I think it's your presentation was quite helpful in, in painting the broader picture. Um, I just thought it was also, it was struck me particularly when you were using some of the slides showing, uh, like say, stamps from a long time ago. Is it on? Uh, stamps from a long time ago, uh, like with the railroads. That, um, and this is not a defense of fossil fuels, but, but I, I think it's always helpful to think about how they got started. And, and if you recall, um, actually fossil fuels saved the whales. Um, we were using um, whale oil for, for illumination and, and uh, people were going further and further out and, and it was the, the major threat for, to the whales. And so actually, um, ironically at the time, it was, it was uh, uh, seen as a godsend to, to the protection of the whales. Um, the, the whole idea of, of, of trains and, uh, and motor cars was actually at the time heralded as a major improvement in, in urban life uh, because uh, there, at the time there were um, lots of uh, very big uh, carts being hauled by, by horses who were leaving their manure on the street. Uh, they often went out of control running over people. Um, and, and cities were considered at the time very dangerous places, very uh, polluted places, and trains in themselves um, were a way to, to enable people to live outside of the cities and have a more semi-rural life. So, you know, when we talk about the infrastructure and the way it's been developed, ironically, at the time that, that cities were moving that way and the whole structure of, of the way we live was being created, it was actually seen as an environmental uh, be, uh, preferable way of living. Um, so just I think it's always, you know, for uh, uh, to avoid hubris, it's, it's good to recall that that uh, on any kinds of these cycles, we always need to be um, aware of uh, unintended consequences mm -hmm. and, and the way that, that an answer to one problem, um, if we are not constantly aware of the lock-in that will occur, could lead to some other problems in the future. Want to take these? Sure. Um, well, I'll start with that, that last one. I mean, I think that's a really important point. I mean, I might challenge a little bit the, the story about why we shifted towards automobility and cars over mass transit systems. I mean, there was a big push from Ford and GM and car companies to go to go down that route, and it's a way more profitable way of organising transport that, than, than the mass transit systems, which served you know, urban poorer people. But I hear what you say. I mean, some of these, the shifts in the past have have had either intended or unintended environmental benefits. And I think it's also, to sort of take that slightly further, we should question the cleanness always of renewable energy. <laughs> um, that always comes with trade-offs. We thought, you know, a lot of people were advocating biofuels as, as, a, as a positive solution. Well, those, those have to be cultivated on someone's land. There's issues of dis displacement, creating uh, price rises around corn. We know, we know some of those impacts. It's all about how you manage those things. You go for electric cars, you have a lithium rush in Bolivia. There's, it creates other socio-environmental conflicts. So my question's about, you know, someone always pays for other people's energy choices is as true of renewables as it is of, of, of fossil fuels. Um, it's a question of either the overall balance of those things or how you minimize uh, some, of those, some of those impacts. Um, so, so I think you're right. I mean, my point about some of the historical parallels was, was looking at what, what are the drivers for the shifts in the system, you know, where people think it's no, it's no longer, they can make more money elsewhere or there's issues of convenience or cost effectiveness and how those, those drivers... And, and the challenge for us this time is the primary driver is not necessarily that. It's not always that we've got something better economically. It's that the driver is environmental. And that's a harder, much, much harder case to make, it strikes me, because some of the alternatives, which are far more destructive environmentally, are still very appealing on economic grounds and convenience grounds and political grounds, as I was showing you know, in the early part of the talk. I think that's, that's the key challenge. But it's a good point to sort of say, you know, Put these things in historical context. There were there were reasons, there were multiple reasons why those decisions were made at particular times, and there's always going to be environmental trade-offs, whichever pathway we go down. I think the key thing is, which is a bit like the just the just transition argument, to try and have an open, honest debate about winners and losers and impacts and how you minimise those or maximise um, the gains. Uh, Laura's first point about um, yeah the, the banks and what we can learn from that. I mean, one thing we learn is that despite 
claims that no no institution is too big to fail. Some of them clearly are. <laughs> and when and when money is needed to bail out banks, it's nearly always there. Um, and that that does in, encourage you know risky behaviour on the part of financial investors, knowing full well that states will always step in to to bail them out. Um, what a, you know on a more sort of serious note in a way though, I think what it suggests is the need to engage in a proper debate about reform of the financial system. And I think, the, you know, again, some of the things that UNEP are looking at are really important here in terms of what's the role of central banks um, in supporting these sorts of transitions that we're talking about. Can we think more seriously, again, about corporate governance and the responsibilities that directors have, et cetera? Can we tighten up disclosure requirements, et cetera, et cetera? So you sort of hardwire in um, mechanisms of oversight and accountability and making sure that shareholders assume more rights as they are at the moment saying well what's you know to shell or bp what's your business model uh, in a world in which we're trying to keep warming under 1.5 or 2 degrees what how are you going to diversify what's your social license to operate in a in a low carbon world you know strengthening those sorts of mechanisms within companies but also at the national level i know i think here in sweden and the netherlands as well according to that unit report um, you know, governments are putting in place policies which require financial actors to justify their existence and their contribution to broader goals of sustainability. So that, again, that's state-led. It's setting the direction of change. And it, you know, it reminds me a little bit of work that Kirsty Hamilton and others were doing a long time ago when they were talking to investors about what would it take for you to shift your investments out of fossil fuels and into renewable energy. And you might may remember the key thing was long, loud, and legal. Right? They want a long time time horizons, you say this is the direction of change, no changes, no ifs, no buts. So irrespective of changes of political government, we're all we all buy into this. And that's obviously the rationale behind climate change committees and, and you know things like that that are above the day to day politicking. But it has to be a loud signal, either through subsidies or support or whatever, and it has to be legal. You know, you have so you clearly lock in the direction of change. And I think those those sorts of things are all are all really important. Right. Sheila and uh, Chris. Hi, um, I was. It was great to see the mention of state-owned enterprise, and it's something yeah. that I kind of spent a lot of time thinking about, but not actually researching or writing about. Um, and I, there's a couple of questions I have. It's sort of linked to Laura's question on the finance sector. Sort of two sides. Well, there's many sides to questions about state-owned enterprise, but one is about if you look at what you mentioned about Carlotta Perez and kind of the force of the finance sector, I mean, how much influence does some, that part of our economy actually have on state-owned enterprise when they may be operating in a way that's kind of completely, in some ways, isolated, yeah. depending on their structure from market yeah. forces? Um, often hearing now also that the ones that will stay in the game, particularly oil and gas, might be um, nationally owned oil companies as opposed to the independent private producers. And lastly, this question of actually, but also could state-owned enterprises be more well placed to navigate the transition because they can operate more on these long, loud, and legal—maybe not legal, but longer ter time horizons—and can, you know, weather storms if they've got government support. So, just your thinking around how much of yeah. some of these arguments work when you're talking about state-owned enterprises yeah, as yeah. opposed to the private companies. Um, thanks. Uh, well, yeah, also, thanks for the the great um, kind of overview presentation. Just a comment, really, about. Um, I guess um, I think it's important if we're thinking about kind of an overview of the political economy of issues related to fossil fuel subsidies to highlight the fact that there can be a there's often a big mismatch between the way we talk about this issue, what the, the goal of fossil fuel subsidy reform is at an international level and what's happening at a national level, and specifically in the context of consumer subsidies. So if you go to any country with large consumer subsidies that's trying to reform them, the two major reasons are number one, uh, the subsidies are really expensive and they want to get that money down. And then number two is often you're seeing a shift in the social contract between the government and its population and how it transfers benefits to them. And if we, if, if, if we imagine ourselves to be kind of governments in this position, the way we're thinking about the political economy, the change that we want to create, and um, the challenges that are making that possible or not are very different. Yeah. Um, and issues can get uh, dropped um, that for an international audience are much more important. So for example, um, if our end point is uh, we want to see um, climate benefits because of fossil fuel subsidy reform, then we really need to care about how is the money spent in se instead. Mm -hmm. So this whole issue of reallocation, you know, if countries are building uh, large uh, volumes of kind of coal-powered uh, uh, kind of generation, then, you know, is the, the savings from gasoline and diesel subsidy reform going into that or not? And how is that kind of figured into political economy? And obviously, 
there are international actors who are trying to influence uh, national actors to reform their subsidies, and that kind of mismatch in terms of you know what are the objectives of each one is quite interesting in kind of understanding how those two things relate to each other. Any further questions still? Okay, two more, and then we'll pass it back to to Peter. In the Tigris into Global Subsidies Initiative. So I have uh, a question which relates a little bit to what Sheila asked, uh, but it's quite broad. Uh, you mentioned these big examples of industrial revolutions in the past. Mm -hmm. To which extent do you think they were private sector driven and to which extent the state can actually do something with respect to future energy transitions? Because we are discussing subsidies, which are a policy mm -hmm. that governments use or can use in the future for a renewable energy sector, uh, whether you think that will be the game changer or possibly not? Uh, thank you for um, an excellent presentation. I, I, um, I just have a question about when we talk about transition, we always talk about transition away from fossil fuels, but uh, if you if you listen to much of the debate within the oil industry, it's actually is transition within fuels. So there's a lot of talk about uh, transitioning from coal to gas, and gas is actually is the bridge uh, for um, uh, perhaps for another, you know, for some sort of uh, future. But also the way that some of the countries, or at least some of the companies, are thinking about the transition is about also using the technology, for instance, CCS, which will allow actually people to continue to use hydrocarbon, uh, while at the same time introducing new technologies like CCS actually to allow uh, uh, the life of this uh, hydrocarbon. So I would say, um, you know, because I come from perhaps, uh, you know, from slightly different perspective, is that there's a huge disconnect between the, the, the way you describe transition here and the way the oil industry and the gas industry are thinking about that transition. Mm -hmm. right. So perhaps I'm, I'm just wondering whether this is something that you can also consider. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see we're getting warmed up. So we have Ron and Aaron, <laughs> and then we go back to, to, to Peter. Just a small point that, that uh, I feel I have to make after whenever I hear about uh, gas as the, as the transition fuel, particularly for electricity generation. Just that, uh, again, I think it's helpful to have a historical perspective here. Back in 1979, the uh, members of the International Energy Agency uh, developed this core set of principles, and one of them was to ban the use of natural gas for power generation. Why? Because they saw it as this uh, very convenient fuel that was that was uh, particularly important for cooking and home heating, um, and and that it was wasteful because of the low thermal efficiency of power generation. Of course, they weren't thinking in terms of combined cycle power generation, but for for electricity, and that was better done by coal. So one of the reasons why. OECD countries in particular have so many coal-fired power plants is because all the other options pretty much were, were, uh, were disqualified. Um, and uh, so it's always amusing to hear that now we're going back to the situation uh, where we were just a few years before that where, in fact, natural gas is increasing as a, as a major fuel. But um, it won't surprise me if in a few years we come back to the situation where people are saying, oh, we shouldn't be using it for power generation, uh, and not for climate reasons, but because of scarcity. Great. I just have, I mean, I'm sure you've got enough questions by now, Peter. So just another, <laughs> another issue to throw on the table I th um, about the political economy aspect is, and something Richard and I have talked about a long time ago, is that thinking about the fossil fuel is not as, a, as an homogenous sector, but as actually this competition within the sector, especially as, as the carbon budget sort of tightens. Uh, and then, for instance, you have things like the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund divesting from coal, and to what extent is that kind of act investment behavior driven by moral concerns? And to what extent is it a, a strategy to, to, to kind of crush coal out of the market and save more carbon space for oil, that kind of thing? So it's a really interesting dynamic as well, looking at the political economy within, between fossil fuel competitors, I suppose. Right. I think that's enough questions. So I think there is. Now you can pick and choose. <laughs> Is it time for coffee, do you say? <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't. Well, I'll try and touch on most of them, hopefully. Um, so Sheila's question, um, yeah, state-owned enterprises. I think it's a really, really important point because in theory you could say there's direct control there. If the state decides to sort of shift direction, it could have that direct power. No, no negotiation or less negotiation, you would have thought. And yet, if you think about Petrobras <laughs> and the Brazilian government, you think about NTPC in India, 
Um, I mean, I remember this is slightly tangential example, but working with some communities. This was in um, Andhra Pradesh in India many years ago, and there's a conflict between a community and NTPC. And you ask them about trying to get accountability for a state-owned enterprise, and it's forget it. There's just so much stake in this. They're, they're so protected by central government. Whatever claims you might make around displacement, environmental impacts, you're going you're to get nowhere because, so, the control and the powers there. If states wanted to use it, but often they don't because they benefit too much from it. Um, and if you think, you know, China Oil Corporation, Petrobras, NTPC, whichever examples you want to look at, it's very, very difficult. Or what often happens is powerful actors like ESCOM in South Africa get to control the pace of transition. So things like the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers uh, Procurement Programme I was talking about, they're often the ones that determine the level of market access for the new entrants in the market. So they're given the power of veto, <laughs> effectively. So it's... You know, the powers are there. If you could persuade the state to change direction, it would be immensely um, beneficial. In reality, the interests are so interlocked that it's, it's sometimes almost harder, I think. Um, so it's a really it's a really good point. Um, Chris's point about mismatch. Yeah, I think a lot of that comes down to the point I was trying to make about horses for courses, that you have to go with the grain of what, what are the objectives in any one setting, that there's a mismatch. Often the drivers of shifts, whether it's around fossil fuel subsidy reform or any other moves are around you know, budget deficits, state expenditure, no longer being able to afford these instruments of one sort or another. Um, like in India's case, it's often about reducing imports of oil, etc. It's energy security type drivers. It's very rarely climate. So even if it comes down as a climate decarbonisation agenda, the only way you'll get buy-in is to frame it in other terms. Um, and I think it's important to, to, to be honest and, and upfront about that. Otherwise, you will get that sort of mismatch about which are the, which are the appropriate levers and policies. So, you know, you need to go with the objectives which make sense in any one setting if you're going to get traction. So even if you and I might be thinking climate decarbonisation, let's talk about reducing public deficits or... <laughs> uh, reducing uh, imports in, in the context in which it makes sense to do. So that would be my sort of strategic way of, of thinking about and answering that question, but it's, it's a good point. Um, what were the other ones? Um, I mean, I take as given the points, for example, around, yeah, lobbying between different fossil fuel interests, all, you know, gas, well, it's gas, nuclear, all of them, like in UK context, the biggest threat to renewables isn't necessarily the fossil fuel interest, well, coal and, and uh, oil it's gas and nuclear saying don't bother with renewables we can deliver this we're low carbon we're the ones to go for that they're, they're from what i hear from people within uk government and now i'm remembering this is being live streamed so i won't say any more than that um <laughs> but you know there's of course there's that intense competition all the time to, to for it, amongst industries to show that there's they offer the way forward that they they can provide a return at the at the best possible price and again perhaps coming back to this point about level of money and bailouts and all of that think about the amount of money the uk government is investing in nuclear energy now and the, and the price guarantees they're offering over massive time frames i mean state resources are there when we really want to use them uh, and again that relates to the link between nuclear and, and the security dimension here because there's, there's clearly another agenda going on there as, as my colleagues Andy Sterling and others have, have shown. Um, the point, the other point about, so I'll take this as the final final one, um, yeah transitions within fossil fuels. Now I take the point you're making, obviously that is the discussion in a lot of places, it's about transition fuels and going from, you know, go to gas first and then to renewables. I guess given the way I started this presentation my concerns would still be around the lock-in, you're still not only is it delaying, but it's, it's producing an element of lock-in to all of these systems. But I recognise in some places that you'll just never win the argument if you talk about a jump straight to renewables. There has to be this more gradual transition. Um, carbon capture and storage, uh, I'm a bit more sceptical about that, um, given how many, how few viable projects there are, how many uncertainties there are about whether it really keeps carbon in the ground, over what time frames, financing for it, etc. Um, but, you know, I recognise if you're working in the Middle East, it's an important argument to have in your in your arsenal if you like um, and I've probably better stop there I think that's fine thanks again uh, Peter for a really really good presentation <laughs> and we now have a 20 minute break and then we, we reconvene at 11 for the first uh, uh, panel session